coaches meeting, and that's about it. So and we'll have you out by 8 o'clock. So um, without ado, let me hit record, and you can go right ahead, Michael. Great. Thanks very, thanks very much. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I wanted to do a whiteboard at the start here. Uh, whiteboard is a, a presentation technique, and you can use this when if you speak to the um, um, if you speak to the Ryla group. Whoops. When we do our when we do our uh, virtual event is instead of beginning with uh, right away with your you know your PowerPoint or your program or whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and the problem with that, it's preordained, right? You create a slideshow guessing and, th and, and predicting what everybody wants to hear from you, and you could be way off. I mean, I've, I've been to pr plenty of presentations where the presenter was too basic or too advanced or they guessed wrong about what I would need. And then I can't wait to get to the Q&A because I want to ask a particular question. He didn't cover my stuff at all. So one way to avoid this, guys, is called the whiteboard technique. And I'm going to demonstrate it for you right now. And then I'm going to use it in this session with you so that you understand how you can. It's a, it's a very uh, customized form of content delivery. And to do so, we're going to do another technique inside of this. It's called the round robin, where we go around the Zoom room very quickly. And I ask you what it is that you want to improve as a speaker, you know, um, and I might salt the tip jar a little bit by making some suggestions. You can write them down if you want. Uh, so you're thinking about this on, as the microphone comes to you. Do you want to have more authority? Do you want to speak with more expertise? Uh, would you like to have people listen to you? Maybe they're not listening to you now when you do a presentation. Do you have a job interview coming up and you want to really crush it and get the job? Um, Maybe you want to be funny when you present. and you, you know, you, You're not as funny as you'd like to be. Uh, maybe you're not organized. Maybe you're nervous before you speak. So when the microphone comes around to you and I say, what would you like to improve as a speaker? I can create either a real whiteboard or a virtual whiteboard. And I, make a, I can even do your first names, right? I can do Peyton wants to do this. Saronia wants to do this. Um, Ganit wants to do this. And then that becomes what they call in the construction business a punch list. And, all, and that's my presentation now. That's all I have to do. I don't have to do some strange 21-slide concoction, right? I'm, I'm going to talk about not approximately what you want me to talk about, exactly what you want me to talk about. Because you just told me that's what you want. It's called the whiteboard technique. So let's try it. We're going to go around the room and talk about and ask each of you what you would like to improve as a presenter. Ganit, let's have you go first. What, what single thing would you most like to improve about your speaking skills? Um, probably like the speed that I speak at. I usually like speak pretty fast. Okay. I'm like overwhelmed. So you want to slow down a little bit when you're speaking. Excellent. So here's my whiteboard now, guys. It's a simple spiral notebook. But I could do it on a whiteboard. Another fun way to do it in a live presentation is you have a Word document up on the screen and then you have somebody keystroke, not you, but somebody else, and have them do it in an extra large font. And now you're creating this giant whiteboard in Word on the screen. You can save the document. You can send it to people afterward. It's the best technique ever. I'm amazed more speakers don't do it. Thank you, Ganit. Let's move over to Anissa. What would you like to improve, ple uh, improve please? Okay. And, and along the way, I might uh, season the conversation a little bit. Why do you think you talk fast, Anissa? What's the reason for that? I think it's just like the nerves of having Yeah. 100%. I've heard it a million times. It's an easy fix. I'm going to help you today, okay? All right. Great. Uh, didn't have a chance to say hi to Frank earlier. How are you, Frank? Good. How are you? Good. You look a year older, man. What would you like to improve about your speaking, sir? Um, I feel like whenever I speak, like, no matter how many times I prepare and like how much I do, I always appear like scatterbrained almost and like the nerves are kind of getting. Okay. That's funny because you don't appear scatterbrained right now. Whoops, the connection freeze. 
Yeah, we lost you, Frank. Hang in there. We'll get you back. <laughs> I think I just got back. Can oh, I yeah. Oh, gotcha. I was saying I feel like there's many times that I could prepare if I at least seem kind of like scatterbrained and nervous when I'm speaking to people. Okay. Um, I just kind of want to appear more collected and put together. Okay, very good. Made a note. Thank you very much. Let's over to, move over to Mariel. Um, hi, and uh, what would you like to improve as a speaker, please? Okay. And uh, just to get inside your head a little bit, why is that a problem for you? Because you know, it's kind of natural for people to stammer and stutter and say, um, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's just because sometimes I say it too much and I just want to seem like more like collected. Okay. I do think there's a balance there. I, I think if you're too perfect as a speaker, uh, it has its own challenges. But I wouldn't want to eliminate all of the ums. Let's see if we can get you to that perfect balance. I'm making a note here. Thank you very much. Julie, something about your presentation skills you'd like to improve? Uh, yes, actually, um, I wouldn't mind improving uh, uh, staying focused and staying on topic. Okay. Very good. I'm going to help you. Thank you very much. And notice what I keep doing during the whiteboard. I keep, I keep showing interest. Like I've heard all these a million times, guys, but I'll never tell you that, right? I make it sound like it's the first time I've heard it. And I, I'm going to help you. I keep saying that. I've got exactly what you need today. This is called establishing positive expectation. The people in the audience want to know that you're good at what you do. They want to know they're in good hands. And sometimes the only way they know that for sure is if you tell them. It sounds wrong, like you would be the last person to tell them that they're in good hands, but you're exactly the right person to say it. So don't be shy about, about doing that. Let's move over to Olivia. What would you like to improve, please? Okay. Uh, sometimes that's referred to as thinking on your feet. You've heard that phrase, Olivia? Is there something that keeps you from thinking on your feet in the way that you'd like to? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, we know that when you're speaking a lot of times, you know, you're not yourself. You know, you, you, your brain's firing in a lot of different directions and you may feel um, like your central nervous system is under siege almost, you know, so you're not quite yourself. It's a very natural feeling, but there are some workarounds that I think that you'll enjoy. Uh, did we do Mario yet? Hi, Mario. How was we did. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Your image went away there for a minute. Okay. Thank you very much. And the order of the, the order of people is changing on my screen. Isn't that fun? Sarah, how are you? What would you like to improve? Hello. I think the main thing for me is improving, like Annette said, um, speed. I tend to talk fast when I feel like I have a lot to say. Okay. So I tend to just speak fast, try to get everything that's on my mind, and like stuttering, and like the ums and the likes. Okay. Yeah, likes is a big one, especially uh, people of a certain age, if you know what I mean, Mario. Very good. Uh, and you know, 90% of this, guys, is awareness. The fact that you're aware that you're doing it is a huge step in the right direction. Good for you. Peyton, did, I know we said hi to you, but did you give us the thing that you want to improve yet? Uh, no. Um, I want to work on like, my stick dance when I'm presenting because I always have like my hands crossed in front of me. And I feel like that's I should be like more assertive and like sure of myself. Okay. You know? Hands and gestures, is that fair? Yeah. Okay, very good. I've got something for you. Saronia, talk to me. Okay, so um, a lot of people tell me that I am good when I'm presenting, like everything is like I stay focused on the crowd. I always like know what I'm talking about, but people often Memorized or robotic because I memorize all my speech, my um, speeches before I um, present. So. 
Oh, good for you. You might have the opposite problem. You know, you might be too collected, too calm. Have you ever, have you ever thought of, considered that? Yeah. Yeah, but you know when it's a balance, right, between spontaneity and too rehearsed. And you know, it's like and I'm not saying you read, but a lot of people read their presentation and when you read, you know, you don't make any mistakes, but you sound like a robot. I'm not saying you do, but there's a like a spectrum, a continuum and you want to be in that sweet spot in the continuum. We're going to get you there. Thank you very much. And it looks like everybody's joined now. Uh, Jay Newman, talk to me. What would you like to improve? Okay, so I think um, holding the attention of the audience and the cadence in which I speak so everything I say is understandable and they're able to kind of stay engaged while I talk. Perfect. I love it. The cadence is so important and most uh, speakers don't talk about this. It's a very, very good thing for us to address tonight. Let's ask our two uh, fearless leaders to weigh in on this as well. Uh, Kyle, you do a lot of speaking. You're in college now. You're, you're presenting to your, to your classes. You've had some employment experience. What would you like to improve? I think I'd just like to improve like the ums as well and the likes because it sounds like sometimes I do, like, kind of like when I'm in the middle of speaking it, I'm like, um, what is that again? And like, I just like, it was like hard to me for me just like to get rid of like likes and ums and all that kind of stuff, like just like marital stuff. I can actually hear you using the word like as you tell me that you don't want to use the word like. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, and George, finally, uh, George, you mentioned your age right before before you uh, before we clicked record. Remind everybody what what ripe old age you are. Sixty-three years young and still learning how to be a better communicator. Why is this is an important thing? You never get perfect at communication, do you, George? Uh, no. In fact, uh, my comment would be all of the above. Okay. Uh, I, I, if I had to focus on something, I'm more of a. I write my speeches out and I memorize them and I read them. And then the other thing that keyed my interest was not so much in the Zoom era. But my mannerisms, I tend to rock back and forth, and I, I don't know how to handle my body language. Okay, so let's put gestures again for you. Yeah. Okay. Yes? I just said twins. You had twins? What? Yeah, sorry. Peyton, you had twin babies? because <laughs> I thought I, you know if that was true I thought well George being 63 is nothing you know okay very good yeah congratulations all right so here's what we've done Saronia can you remind me of what your thing was I missed it here in my notes uh, keep talking there's a little delay in your microphone Yeah. Like, like, what I'm having trouble with? Yes. Keep talking. Did anybody hear? Sounding like a robot. Sure robot. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that was the two. That was the two perfect thing. I got it. And Sarah, can you review for us one more time what your thing was? Okay. Something that I've made, and also my use of like and ums. <laughs> okay, very good. All right, so here's here are my notes, guys. Um, let me make one more little mark here. Because part of what I'm doing right now is thinking on my feet. As you know, I don't have a pre-prepared presentation. I'm creating the presentation in real time. That's the art of customization. So as I do this. I'm trying to make connections in, in what we're talking about. 
I could use more colors, I suppose, but the real thing here is I'm trying to connect the dots. For example, I now know that several of you want to talk about pace and speed. Ganit, Anissa, Mar Mariel, uh, and Jay talked about cadence and speed. Maybe somebody else. So let's talk about, about this. The average person speaks at about 150 words a minute. In, in my business, we call it WPM, words per minute. So if you wanted to inject energy into your talk, how fast would you speak, everybody? Anybody? Faster than 150, right? George, what are you saying? Twice as fast? Twice as fast is really super fast. Yeah, so it actually bumps up to about 180, 185 words a minute. So think about a television pitch man or somebody that is really trying to get you excited about something. Um, it's not quite as fast as high school age people talk. Uh, a lot of college age people talk, especially if they really get going like this and they're really, you know, generating a lot of syllables quickly. You could get into the 200 words per minute range. But you probably, probably would not want to do that on a microphone in front of a group of people. It would be viewed as uh, non-business-like or maybe unprofessional. So we just want to move it into that 180 or 185. Now, if you were telling a sad story or you were making a very important point, how many words per minute would you slow down to? And you might guess 135 130 words a minute. If I'm going to include silence, it would be even slower. But it's only becoming slower because I'm not filling up those words. I'm not filling up that 60 second time frame with actual verbiage. It takes a lot of courage to use silence. But if you can use, learn to use silence when you speak at your age, you will become a remarkable communicator. Nobody does it even as adults. So now we're addressing a few things, guys. We're addressing this pace issue, the speed issue. We're addressing um, how to keep people interested because I'll, move, I'll bump up to 185 words a minute if it seems like people are getting a little sleepy or drowsy. And nobody really sleeps during my presentations. You've, you've seen me do my thing. And then I can dial it back. Notice how I actually move back to do that. I can dial it back to 155 if I need to but I don't stay there long, especially with a younger audience. I get right back into that fast gear. So we're using cadence and speed, specifically WPM, to keep people interested, keep the conversation ebbing and flowing to the extent that we need it to. Excellent. Most young people, most people your age that I know, speak at one pace except when you're really down, and then, you, and then you might, so it's like two speeds. But when you can adjust and, and you can master this, you become a really, really sharp communicator. And you'll find that people start paying attention to you uh, in ways that they never did before. So that's cadence and speed. Um, let's talk about gestures. A number of you mentioned gestures and hands. Uh, and there are ways that you can use your hands to uh, impact the general uh, efficiency and effectiveness of what you're saying. So a couple quick basics. I think it was, um, let's see, who mentioned hands? It was Peyton, I think, that mentioned hands. This is called steepling, Peyton. Uh, it's, it's done like, it's, it gets its name from this. It's a very symmetrical thing that we do with our hands. And sym symmetry is boring. Right? So if you find yourself doing symmetry, it's, you're not really exciting the audience. What, look at the difference between like if we were doing a screenshot of me doing this or a screenshot of this. You see the difference? One of them is more dynamic. One of them, your eyes, your eyes in, a, in a thumbnail uh, array, your eyes would move toward the, the, the uh, image that is asymmetrical. So I like to do this a lot, and you'll see speakers do this. I'm currently interviewing a lot of speakers from the National Speaker Association on my podcast. And a lot of them get the same training. And uh, there's this thing that they do, this... <laughs> you've never seen people do this? 
it's I call it ping pong because I mean, I'm just going to I'm going to do two things and I'm going to just do that back and forth like this. And I might even develop the habit of doing this too much. Have you ever seen a speaker do this like 50 times in a one hour segment? You know, it's too much. So the other thing that we do is we walk to this side of the stage and then we walk to this side of the stage and then we walk over here again. And that's another version of ping pong. And so these are very predictable things that speakers do. And you can, you can, you can do it to get attention, but if you do it too much, the attention goes away. So it's something to keep an eye on. Hand gestures and so on. This is a closed gesture. This is an open gesture. If you want the audience to be tight and yeah, do it with me. Thank you, George. Do it with me, everybody. Nice and closed. Do this one. Steepling. Do this one. Hands and hands in your pockets. We see guys do that a lot, right? And it's all closed. What we want to do instead in the front of the room and what we want you to do on Zoom even in front of the Rila audience is open gestures like this one. Go ahead. I call this, and some of you know this, the sun coming up because it's kind of like the sun coming up. Uh, guys have trouble with this one because it seems, I don't know, theatrical or something. But women uh, gravitate toward this. Females gravitate toward this all the time. Um, and another one is, you know, you can just do half the sun coming up, one hand or the other, right? whatever your favorite hand is. And I like to gesture toward the crowd. What do you think? You see? Watch the difference between what do you think and this. What do you think? Which one's more inviting? The gesture, right? Uh, you'll see speakers who don't ha quite have it together. They just kind of, you know, what do you think? And that's kind of awkward too. What do you think? And you might even, you might even say, you know, and on, and on Zoom, here's a Zoom technique. I'll show you some Zoom techniques tonight because of course our event is virtual this year. I might say in, I, in a live audience, I might gesture to the person in the third row just like this. What do you think? Person in the plaid shirt. And now he knows exactly what I'm talking about but I can really cheat on Zoom because all of your screen names are here and I can say, what do you think, George? So now I don't have to gesture. I can say, what do you think, George? But watch what happens when I gesture. What do you think, George? You see how I become more open. And when my expression is open, watch the difference between a closed expression. I'll do it close. What do you think, George? <laughs> it's almost... It's almost like interrogation. What do you think, George? Versus, watch what happens when I raise my eyebrows, my whole expression opens up. Or a smile, right? What do you think, George? You see? It's, it's just a much different appeal. And you seem, when you seem open, the audience will open. If you seem closed, the audience remains tight, uptight, and closed. So you can fix this if you want. Um, by the way, I notice if some of you are closing your screens off and you may have reasons for doing this. When you close your screens off, I can't see you anymore and I assume you're closed. Why wouldn't I? If your screens are on and you're paying attention and I can see the whites of your eyes, I assume you're still with me. And this is a constant battle in the Zoom world is to have people keep their screens open as long as possible. Now, thank you very much. I, I wasn't uh, playing to you, Sarah. But it is a serious issue. And if you don't mind, I prefer that your screen is on. So thank you very much. I know some of you are in public places or maybe you're in a bedroom with dirty clothes on the floor and you don't want us to see it. I get it. Um, one of the challenges we have in the Zoom world when we have 50 or 100 people on the call is the bandwidth gets too heavy and then we actually request people to close down their cameras. But that puts the speaker in an awkward situation because now I'm just talking to all these avatars and I can't tell for sure if I'm connecting with you. So it's a very delicate thing presenting on Zoom. I'm on the whiteboard again. I could do this on a, I actually have a whiteboard I've used in the past. I don't know if you can see it over there. And I point the camera toward that or I just use my old Flintstone spiral notebook whiteboard. Uh, but I'm using now my, my, my little punch list to get through this presentation and it will take up the rest of our time. We're going to do a Q&A session here in just a second. Um, so now we've covered pace and uh, words per minute and speeding up and slowing down. 
uh, and gestures. Let's do another one that a lot of people had issues with, with which was alms and the stray types of stammers. Uh, Muriel mentioned it. Kyle mentioned it. A uh, number of people mentioned the ums and the ahs. Now, if you remember nothing that I say today, remember this. When you are too perfect, you are not a good presenter. And that's interesting because everybody's trying to be perfect. Some of you, by your own admission, wouldn't want to cut out all those little mistakes. And I say that makes you too perfect. And when you're too perfect, you're boring and people stop listening. Some of my best moments, and you can check out on my YouTube channel, some of my best moments where I get the biggest audience laughs is when I trip on myself. I say something silly or I say something that's, you know, uh, I didn't mean to say. And you almost can feel people leaning in. Oh, he made a mistake. The professional speaker made a mistake. I love that because it makes me human. And when I'm a human, you can identify with me. That's why laughter is such a great thing when you're speaking. By the way, I always tell people not to tell a joke. It, never, it almost never works out. These comedians, they're professionals. If you're not a professional comedian, don't tell a joke. It's not going to go well. But you can be clever and you can be witty and you can be charming and you can be human. And these are the things that we ask you to think about trying when you're in front of the Ryla crowd. Um, so, say I just said, um, did you think anything of it? Did you hear me? Um, it was natural. It's fine. Now, Kyle says like a lot and he knows it. And so we're going to give him special techniques that, that he can get away from it. One of the techniques, and it's an easy one, see this rubber band? You put the rubber band around your wrist like this and you make it a little bit tight. And then every time you say, um, Kyle, you zap yourself. And in a few seconds, your wrist is going to be raw. Uh, um, I'll tell you what, I'm going to zap. I'm going to zap myself every time I say it, if I can remember. And uh, we want to, we want to find ways to discourage ourselves from doing that. So if you can get a speaker buddy to kind of turn you on to it, it's a good way to go. You can do that for anything that you want to avoid. By the way, I highly recommend recording yourself. So you can do it very easily with your own iPhone now. I happen to have mine set up on a tripod right now. You can uh, record yourself and watch it back. And then you got your band on your wrist. You snap yourself every time you do it in the recording, Kyle. Awareness is 90% of the battle, everybody. And one of the best ways to become aware of what you're doing is to watch yourself in video. I'm old enough. George McMullen is old enough to remember when voicemail uh, machines came out. They were called, uh, were they called voicemail machines? Voice recorders. We called them some. Answering machine? Answering machine, that's what we called Answering it. Machines, yeah. yeah. We don't even have them anymore because they're built into the cell phone. But when answering machines first came out, guys, nobody wanted to listen to their own voice. It was too uncomfortable. We kind of gotten past that now, but now nobody wants to watch recordings of themselves. And unfortunately, that's the best way to become good at speaking. The good news is you don't even have to embarrass yourself in front of a group of people. I could literally, because I have set a second camera set up right now, I could just give that presentation to this camera and then watch it. And I could watch, you know, if I'm rehearsing for, uh, um, uh, to do a presentation for school or whatever. How many of you are doing, uh, by the way, I'm going to do a speaker trick right now. How many of you are doing uh, homeschooling right now, at least part of the time? Not, not called homeschooling. What do you call it? Distance learning? What are you calling it, uh, Ganit? In Distance your... learning. Distance? My school calls it remote learning. Yeah, it's all the same, right? But, the, but it's, a, it's a weird thing. And the teachers are really struggling with this. So please be patient with them. They're, they're trying to get used to this new rhythm. Hopefully they're, they're, they're picking it up by now. But distance learning, you're now having to present to the group and hold their attention. And you can tell when you're not holding their attention. So if you really want to get good at this, you want to press record either on your voice memo on the iPhone. I think it's called a voice memo. Uh, or 
actually record yourself just in the same way you do a selfie, right? You reverse the screen and you record yourself giving a little presentation about something and it's fantastic for rehe uh, rehearsal for, for the big time. Um, a lot of people now are applying for jobs in interviews on Zoom. And so if you didn't think this was a valuable skill and you're looking for that $15 an hour job or $25 an hour job and you really want that job, you want to get out your recorder and practice the interview, practice entering, answering, and they're always the same questions. Where do you see yourself in five years? You know, tell me about a time you solved this problem with another person. You, you know all these interviews. You can get Google, what are the top 10 most commonly asked interview questions? And they're all the same. They've been the same for years. So there you go. Interview question that basically happens in a scholarship interview. <laughs> same ones, right? Very predictable. So you can game the system, but you got to get in front of it a bit. Okay. Olivia, what did you want to learn about? Remind me. Okay, so let's talk about on your feet. I know that a number of people mentioned that. Um, oh, here you are, Olivia. Thank you. I had you written down twice, and one of them was blank. The other one said, think on your feet. Duh. Okay. And uh, for those of you that don't want to be as robotic, don't want to be as perfect, you want to think on your feet and improvise a little bit, these are some techniques that you can learn. So... The very first technique for thinking on your feet, Olivia, is to buy yourself time. You don't have to reply right away. You can think about it for a second. Does that make sense to you, Olivia? And can you think of a technique, Olivia, that would buy you some time? You've seen speakers do this a million times. I'll bet you know what it is. You could ask them to repeat the question. Oh, 100%, man, 100%. So when, when you say to them, when you say to them, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? You just bought yourself twice as much time because it's going to take them just as much time to say it the second time. It's a remarkable technique. Now, you can't say that every time. Like in Kyle's thing, you know, you're in, you're in for an interview. You just can't keep saying, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> but you, so this is like a, a face, if you're playing cards, it's like a face card. It's an ace. You only have four of them, right? Or a few of them. And you get, only get to play that once in a while. Another great technique, though, besides can you repeat the question is compliment them on the question. What a great question. Nobody ever asks me that. And I love it. Right? And now I bought five more seconds because my hard drive is spinning the entire time I'm giving the compliment. Oh, yeah, great question. What am I going to say next? <laughs> you know? Okay. Um, now, this is an advanced technique. One, uh, um, well, I, I, let me show you another technique. It's called the stall, and I've, I've shown some of you how to do that. I say, uh, excuse me one second. I want to get a quick sip of water right? Excuse me one second. I just want to get a quick sip of water. I didn't say I'm stalling for time or I don't know the answer. I said, excuse me one second. I want to get a sip of water. And they'll believe you. But what are you doing? Oh my God, what am I going to say now? Oh. You know, I think of what you're going to say next. Now here's an advanced technique. I just gave you the 101 techniques. Here's the 201 technique. And you've seen me do this live. They'll ask me a question, and I'll say, well, I think there are two things that you can do. So now I'm, I don't even, sometimes I don't even know what the second thing is when I say that. Two confessions, guys. But I'm going to come up with a second thing. I just know there's two, there's got to be two things that you could do. And then I can always add a third thing if I want. But, I'll, but that's, that's I'm, I'm actually, it's like a, it's like a, almost like a trick, right? I don't even know what the second thing is yet. I could say this, I'll bet there are two or three things that you could do uh, to handle this type of a situation. So the first thing I would suggest, I still haven't thought of the second thing yet. The first thing I could suggest is this, do this. And I'll explain this a little bit. And while I'm doing this, the second thing comes to me like a gift from above. And I go, the second thing you want to do is this. 
And, he, and then I get, oh, a bonus tip. Thank you. And here's a bonus tip. And I seem like the most together person on the planet. But I only had one thing when I started talking. But, but here's the thing, guys. I really know my stuff. I've been teaching presentation coaching for years now. Years. And I know all the tricks. And they're, they're on my hard drive. It's not going to be any memory loss, right? It's going to come to me. And it's going to come to me so fast, you won't even know I was waiting on it. And you can know your content that good too because you're presenting on things that work. Who has a presentation to give coming up? Anybody? Hands up. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, what is your upcoming presentation about? What a coincidence. That's what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you really study mental clarity and you have 10 things, you know, that you can talk about and, you know, they just jump into your head because you know, you're not, you know what you're doing. Are you allowed to use notes? I mean, if I, I feel like I could just so I could be aware of it. Yeah. Or, or talking points, you know, and there's tricks for this too, like, um, I often do a, um, these are some exercises I'm looking at doing, so I'm going to use this as a prop. Think of this as a blank sheet of paper. And I think I've shown you this before, maybe not. This is called a trifold, right? Why? Because I'm going to fold it in threes. And now it's a strip of paper, and I can tape this to my computer. Watch where I'm going to tape it. Where am I going? Yeah, so that's right. It's just to the right of the lens. Now, no offense, but I just covered up half the class, including you, Gio. But I can see my talking points very easily now, and I can, I can steal a look at them without you ever knowing that I was looking at them, Sarah. So that makes me seem even more together, right? It's my hard drive plus my cheat sheet. Pretty cool. Now, if you're not supposed to be cheating with your, you know, don't cheat. But almost everybody now these days, they'd rather have a good presentation than to have you fumbling and stumbling. So it, this cheat sheet, even professionals use it. My gosh, the, the newscasters use a cheat sheet. What's it called? The tele, tele, teleprompter. teleprompter. And you could get a teleprompter on your phone, by the way. It's an app. And it'll, it'll scroll your entire thing. You could set it to how fast you want it to go, 150 words a minute, whatever. You know, so use these, use these uh, strategies and these techniques, guys. It'll only put you in good stead with your audiences. We're going to do some Q&A here in just a second to wrap things up. Let me make sure I'm, I'm handling the punch list. Some of you wanted uh, this idea of thinking on your feet. Um, I keep a thing called a ringer, I -R, sorry, R-I-N-G-E-R, -E a ringer. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a spare content, like a joke or an anecdote or a riddle or a current event, right? I keep it in my back pocket and I can pull it out whenever I need to, right? Uh, what's a good ringer? Polio, uh, polio, Rotary has a, a long term campaign called End Polio Now. And uh, there's a technique called personification that can help us keep the campaign alive. Personification means instead of talking about polio statistics and which countries still have it and all these numbers and all this boring stuff, I'm going to personify polio. I'm going to talk about people you know or might know that have polio. And I might mention the name of Itzhak Perlman, perhaps one of the most famous classical musicians of our time. He plays violin. How many of you know Itzhak, the name Itzhak Perlman? Maybe a few. He actually performs from his wheelchair now because he can't get out of it. So he, he, he rolls onto the stage at his performances in his wheelchair and he spins around to perform for the audience. He's got his violin with him. And it's compelling. It's sad. But it's also, a, it's also a victory, right? There's a guy that learned how to live with this terrible disease. And if I was raising money for polio, if I'm going to try to keep this in mind for you, 
I would have this in my back pocket as a ringer anecdote to either kill time or set the stage or deliver a presentation technique called personification. See what I just did? And when you, when you get, as you age, as you mature and you become more sophisticated, you'll, you'll develop this palette, right? A palette is like a menu. Um, a lot of young people, you know, somebody's actually coming, you know, phoning in from McDonald's today. The, the, the palette or the menu at McDonald's is not very deep. What, 15, 18 items. But if you go to a fine dining restaurant, there's all kinds of, there's, there's appetizers and there's soups and salads and there's entrees and there's desserts and there's, dessert, there's after dinner drinks and all this stuff. There might be 75 items on the sophisticated menu. And that's what you're becoming when you understand how speaking really works. So, uh, we have one more topic, I think, which was uh, being scatterbrained and nervous. And, and we'll do this and then we'll do Q&A and answer any other questions that you might have. And Kyle might have some final instructions for you as, you, as we get ready for the virtual Ryla this year. Um, so let's talk about this idea of nervousness and scatterbrain and all this kind of stuff. So does anybody get nervous going on Zoom or is that different than being live in front of people? Talk to me. Take yourself off mute. Easier on Zoom. I would agree, yeah. How many people agree? Give me the, that thumbs up button in the reactions. You know the one I'm talking about? How many agree it's easier on Zoom? Does anybody think it's just as nerve wracking on Zoom? I mean, it could be just as nerve wracking depending on who. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ganit, for being honest. Everybody's being honest today. Frank, thoughts? I mean, I've talked like this on my virtual classes and things before, but I've yet to actually present, um, like slides or things like that. So right. I'm like waiting to see what that's like. Right. Okay. Everybody's different. Sometimes, depending on the audience, I'm more anxious and nervous about Zoom than I am in person. So it depends on who I'm talking to. Depends if I ate if I if I ate enough calories during the day. I'm not lightheaded. If I got sleep the night before, it's all these things. But there are tricks to get by, and I'm going to show you a few of them right now. So the, the first one is to have that little cheat sheet, three things that you want to make sure you mention. And if you're presenting to the Ryler group, you should have you know those three things. It's just a skeleton. It's not word for word. They are keywords, right? Here are the three things I'm going to talk about. Uh, and that's the first technique. It's the cheat sheet. The second technique for nerves is an old yoga trick. So we're going to take our, you can do this with me. You're going to take your thumb and your forefinger like this, and then you're going to drop them into your lap. I can't see them now. And your palms are up and you just drop them into your lap like this. And it's a centering type of a gesture. If you do it often enough, you start to understand how this works and you start to go to this like Zen calm place. Anytime you're excited, Anytime you need to calm down, and some people combine breathing. Let's do a quick breathing exercise because this will help you settle down too. This is called box breathing, and the idea is you would count to four as you inhale, and you would count to four as you exhale. Now, it's going to take a second for you to understand the rhythm because most of us don't box breathe naturally, but let's try it together. I'll be your narrator, and I'll count to four. So when I say go, I want you to breathe in a little bit slowly, and then we're going to have you breathe out just like this, okay? So here we go. Ready? Breathe in. One, two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Breathe in. Two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. No yawning, Sarah. What the heck? <laughs> well, the point is that you would slow everything down. You're probably breathing too fast. Your, your heart rate's probably higher than it needs to be, and you're all ratcheted up. Maybe you got some caffeine going or some chocolate, 
and you're too ratcheted up and your, your own system's working against you if you're trying to be calm. So often, backstage, before my name is announced, and I'm going on stage in front of 400 people, 398 of whom I've never met before at a live event, and I'm trying to calm myself, and that's how I do it. You don't see me doing this at Uriah because I've done it so many times, I don't really have the nerves issue, but some of you may be experiencing this, and that's a technique for slowing, slowing everything down, at least giving yourself a chance to be organized. George? Okay. Um, and then finally for nerves, um, oh, we find that we're just nervous in that first part of the presentation and then because that's the worst part. And once you, if you hang in there and you're able to push past it, everything becomes better. You feel like you're, you know, you're resonating a little bit with the audience and you're feeling better. And the technique for that is to over-rehearse the intro, the first part of your presentation. That's the one you want to read into the phone. Like you don't have to do the one into the phone, your whole presentation into the phone. If you only have a few minutes to practice, keep practicing the intro because that's when you're going to be most discombobulated. Okay, you've been very patient, listening, taking notes, some of you. Thank you very much. Um, I've finished the punch list now, so just to wrap up the whiteboard, I've delivered not a preordained 26-slide PowerPoint presentation. I answered exactly what you wanted to hear. And if I didn't, I'm giving you a chance to answer, to ask again in Q&A. So we're going to open up the uh, conversation now for anybody that wants to ask a question that's related to something that we've talked about or uh, something fresh and new. Maybe, maybe something came up just now that we you know, didn't have in the whiteboard. What do you think? Stage, yeah. we get to move our hands. But I feel like over Zoom, I don't want to do it where I feel like I'm like, so here, here, here. And then I also have a question about what do you do in a situation where like you disconnect in the middle of a presentation? Okay, good, both good questions. Let's handle the disconnect first. Uh, that's, that's usually done in housekeeping. I mean, it was much more difficult uh, early on, Sarah, when nobody knew how to work, use Zoom. Now, uh, when I get disconnected, people often call back before I do, uh, which is great. They understand you're just going to dial back in. And that's almost always the fix. Does anybody have another fix besides calling back in? And you might early on say, listen, um, we're recording this call. If we get disconnected, it's going to be posted at such and such. Or make sure you go to our Facebook page so that you can... Uh, uh, see the afterglow of the presentation or we can stay connected there. Sometimes I give my cell phone number. There's all kinds of ways to stay connected. As for your second question, let's talk about some Zoom techniques that will serve you very, very well. Um, the first one it has to do with uh, eye contact. And this is a very uh, important thing and I'm surprised more people don't understand it yet. When I'm presenting on Zoom, there are three places my eyes want to go. What's the first place my eyes want to go? What do you think? I want to look at you. I want to see your face. I'm looking at Jay Newman right now. I'm looking at Jay. Hey, Jay. Uh, I might also look over at George, right? So my eyes are drawn to the people I'm looking at. Is he smiling? Are they laughing? Are they writing? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? The second place I want to look is at myself. How's my hair? How, oh, that sweater. I should have thrown that in the dryer before I got on. It's really a little bit wrinkled, you know. And here's the thing, guys. Those are the two places you should not be looking. There's the third place that you should be looking, and where is it? That's right, George. It's the lens of the camera. So I have to ignore all the beautiful people on the call if I want to look them in the eye. And that's a hard thing to do, but it's kind of like driving. 90% of the time in the, in the windshield, 10% in the rearview mirror. 
90% of the time in the lens of the camera and 10% of the time I'm doing reference checks. Jay Newman's thirsty. Peyton's still, still uh, at McDonald's maybe. Frank is paying attention. Kyle is smiling. So I can just get a quick reference and then I go right back to the lens again. Let's also tackle this. This is called video hygiene. Some of you need it. Check out my frame, everybody. So let's do the first, the positioning, the head positioning, right? So um, it's called head room. That is the distance at the very top of the frame. Some of you have huge amounts of headroom. Julie, Olivia, you can fix this if you care to. George even. And the reason you want to fix this is because if you want influence, you're supposed to be the speaker. You're supposed to have influence. Tell me you have a call to action. And you will be less influential if you have less headroom. You see what happened to my image just now? Is it? Tell me which one is more influential, this one or this one? It's the second one, for sure. And so how do you adjust the headroom? You can do it with your posture. You can do it with a tilt of the screen if it's a laptop, right? Um, I know people that prop up the screen on books and tilt it. Like I used to have a screen that didn't tilt on my desktop and I would, I would put something underneath the back of the screen which would tilt it toward me. There's all kinds of tricks for this. But you do not want to be the lowest person on the call, especially if you're the speaker. Okay, Ganit, you could probably use for less headroom too. Can you fix it or no? Yeah, there you go. Nice job. That's it. And the other thing is distance. You know, if you're the furthest away, George was suffering from this a little bit, but maybe he's comfortable. Maybe he's stretched out. When you're the furthest away, you also are not going to be the most influential. And by the way, there's a penalty for being too close. It's called big head. Nobody wants that. So you want to find the nice balance there, and that's the place to be. Thank you, Jay. Uh, finally, there's a thing in Zoom Hygiene that uh, you want to work on the background. Now, I've been fooling with my plants in the background, but um, they say that whatever you have in the background of your Zoom screen tells about who you are as a person. What do you think? Jay, are you a brick wall? <laughs> um, if you're a doctor and you have certificates behind you, you're, you're a um, credentialed person, right? You're accomplished. If you've got trophies behind you, you're accomplished. Now, they could be fake trophies. I don't want to be too weird about this. If you've got plants behind you, could you be a nurturing person? Maybe. If you've got art behind you, are you a creative person or an artistic person? Maybe. If you've got nothing behind you, are you not interested in art? Are you not a creative person? Maybe. But people sometimes judge us by the signals that we send. If you've got a bunch of dirty laundry and you're in a filthy environment behind you, people are noticing. So they have all of these um, artificial Zoom uh, backgrounds. I don't care for them. I'd rather see your real room, even if it's dirty. At least I'm learning something about you. George, I see you've got a lot of wall hangings. I can't see what they are, but they look like they might be mementos or this type of a thing, which is fine. Um, Sarah, there's something behind you up above, but I can't really see what it is. Yeah. It's what? It's a makeup room. It's like an art, makeup, art room. Okay, cool. Like, yeah. So I, I didn't used to think that this was an important thing. And then I got reviewed by a website called Rate My Room. And they're the same people that helped Jimmy Kimmel and the Grammy uh, participants set up their room for the Grammys. And I got a 10 out of 10 because the screen that I showed on that particular day, it's going to be a light in the way there. See the light? But what they said was, uh, 
great art, plants, and suit of armor for the win. 10 out of 10. Because I happen to have a suit of armor in my office. And it's a unique piece. So if you can figure something like this out, if you're on screen a lot, if it's important to you, you can, you can work this out for yourself. So those are some tips for Zoom hygiene and being better on camera. I hope that's helpful to you, Sarah. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? I think we had booked an hour with you guys and we want to respect your time.